Christianity centres around the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, which I would encourage you to turn with me in a Bible or a device if you've got one in front of you, we are brought face to face with the reality of who Jesus is and what he came to do. This is um, a glorious passage. It, it's, it's a mountaintop passage, literally because it describes an event that took place on top of a mountain, and figuratively because it gives us a glimpse into the unveiled glory of Jesus Christ. Who Jesus is, is on full view for us in this passage. May the Lord help us to see it together with the eyes of faith. The view that is on display here in this passage of Holy Scripture is something that we desperately need to see. Because if we get into perspective the glory of who Jesus is uh, and what he has come to do, what he has done, then our lives will never be the same again. We will be changed as we behold him. That was true for Peter, James, and John. They were the three disciples that were brought with Jesus on top of the mountain to see and experience this great sight, this, this great historical happening. And Peter would later write in his letter, his second letter, that they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Think of that hymn, Your Majesty, I can but bow, I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, 2 Peter 1 verse 16. And John would write in John 1 14, as we read at the beginning of this service, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But what did they actually witness and behold? Well, I, I want us to go through this passage and, 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 and see what is on display here for us. Uh, and, and may the Lord help us to grasp something of the richness that is revealed to us in this passage. First of all, there was transfiguration. Peter, James, and John witnessed Jesus transfigured. That is, they saw him changed physically, literally, so that something of his heavenly, heavenly brilliance was on display. One moment, Jesus was walking with them up the mountain as sweaty and as dirty as the rest of them. Uh, yes, they, they, they grasped who he was, but he, he just looked like another man. The next moment, he was shining with a purity so white that no human on earth could replicate it. Look at verse 3. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. There's so much descriptive language here. They, they, they were taken aback by how shining bright white Jesus was. And this bright shining from this person on top of this mountain, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, such shining has happened before in the Scripture. Moses' face shone as he came down from Mount Sinai having received the law of God from the hand of the Lord. He'd been in the presence of God. He'd seen God face, he'd spoken, as it were, face to face with God. Exodus 34, 29, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Something of the glory of God had rubbed off, we can say, on him. He'd been standing face to face with the living, eternal, glorious, and holy God. And something of this glory was visible in Moses. But the difference between that occasion and the transfiguration 
was that Moses' glory was a reflected glory, like that of the moon reflecting the sun's rays and so making it look bright as if it has a light of its own. But Jesus' glory was all his own. It wasn't a reflected glory. On Mount Sinai there was a reflecting, but on Mount Hermon, the high mountain that Mark tells us that Jesus and the disciples had climbed, there was an unveiling. An unveiling of what? An unveiling of the power and of the glory that was always there. Sometimes we can be staggered at the gifts or abilities of friends that we've known and been close to uh, for a number of years. Perhaps we knew that they were okay at singing, but then we heard them sing and we were completely taken aback at their ability as a singer, the, the tone of their voice and the range and, and, and the volume, and they could just sing. We didn't know that. Perhaps we knew that they played a sport or an instrument, and it was just a fact that we knew about them, but when we heard them, when we saw them perform, we were lost for words. And in a far greater way, Peter, James, and John were brought into a deeper appreciation of the awesome reality of what they already knew to be true, that their master was none other than the promised Messiah and the eternal Son of God. What a realisation must have dawned on them. We read that they were petrified, they, they, they were terrified, one of the other gospel writers even says that after the, the experience they fell asleep and, 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 and we can only assume that this was because they were so physically taken aback, so exhausted by the glory of God that, that, that they almost passed out. They saw Jesus for who he is. Full of glory. In one sense the same. He was still Jesus. But in another sense different because they saw him as he truly is. I wonder, have you seen Jesus for who he truly is? But why did this happen? Well, because Jesus promised that it would. Look at verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. These three favoured disciples were being let into a taste of what God's kingdom coming in power would look like. It was a foretaste of a time when Jesus would no longer be despised and rejected by men, the carpenter of Nazareth, but rule over them as the conquering king of heaven. This has taken place. It is taking place. And it will take place. It took place when Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he had fully and finally defeated sin and death and Satan and hell itself. It took place when he ascended to his Father and was welcomed into the gates of heaven, having completed the work that his Father had sent him to do. And all of heaven rejoiced as the gates opened and the Son walked in and was accepted by the Father in the highest throne. It took place when he sent the Holy Spirit into the world at Pentecost so that the kingdoms of the world would be reached with the kingdom of God that every language and tribe and tongue and nation would bow before the King, King Jesus, in humble adoration. It is taking place as the Lord Jesus rules supreme over his church, sovereignly working all things for the good of his people, interceding for them, strengthening them to see that the work of the gospel goes on, and it will take place when he returns in glory and majesty and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They saw transfiguration. 
a taste of things to come. But they also heard conversation. Secondly, conversation. Some conversations are well worth listening into. And some conversations people would go to great lengths uh, to get a hearing of. I expect there are a lot of people who would like to hear the conversations that are going on in the royal palace at the moment. But as Peter, James and John saw the Lord transfigured, they were brought into a conversation like no other. Have a look at verse 4. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. This verse leaves us with a whole lot of questions. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? What were Moses and Elijah doing there with Jesus? How were they even there with Jesus? They having left the scene of human history so many years ago. And what were they talking about? Well, the answer to this middle question of how, how were they even there with Jesus, in some sense is an easy one. They were there by the power of God. The same power that created and sustains all things. The same power that had been at work throughout history in making salvation known parting the Red Sea for Moses, sending fire for Elijah, the same power that had sent the Son of God to be born of a virgin and had revealed something of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ on this mountain, also brought these ancient prophets from yesteryear, from the everlasting glory to the presence of the King on top of the mountain. At this point, we do well to pause and to worship. This is not just a problem to be solved. We're given revelation in Scripture that we might worship God. And so we do well to take the words of Isaac Watts, where reason fails with all her powers, their faith prevails and love adores. This was a unique moment. That's the how. What about the why? Moses and Elijah were significant figures of the Old Testament. Moses as the instrument that God used to bring his people out of Egypt, out of slavery in the Exodus, and to give his law not only to the Jewish people, but to the whole world. And Elijah as representative of the great Old Testament prophets who fearlessly preached the word of God. Together they represented the law and the prophets. And there they stood, witnessing their fulfillment in Christ that the ministries that they had come, bringing the law, declaring the word of God as the prophets, all pointed to this moment. But what were they talking about on top of this mountain? Well, Luke gives us some insight. They were talking about his decease, Luke 9, 31, or more literally, Jesus Christ. Exodus. The fact that he would die. This had already featured in Jesus' discussion with his followers. Have a look at verse 31. He'd already told them that he must suffer, he must be rejected, and he must be killed. And how fitting that he should now speak to Moses about it. The geographical Exodus from Egypt that Moses had led, pointed to Jesus' exodus. However, Jesus' exodus would not accomplish deliverance from physical bondage and human oppression, but from the bondage and oppression of sin, and the bondage and oppression of Satan and of death 
and of hell. And you know, if you're not in Christ this morning, you're still under these bondages of sin and Satan and death and hell. But here, they spoke about the exodus that was to come. What happened under Moses' leadership was a picture of what Christ would do at Calvary. He would enter enemy territory in order to rescue his people. I wonder, have you been rescued from sin and Satan and death and hell in the exodus that happened when Jesus went to the cross and took the punishment for sin? But how fitting also that Elijah was there. Not only had every prophet who had ever been raised up pointed forward to Christ's coming by their lives, by their lives and by their ministry. But it was prophesied that before Christ's coming, one like Elijah would come first. And as Jesus explained to his confused disciples in verse 12 and 13, this had already happened. John the Baptist had come in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for Jesus' arrival. And as he had suffered under the hands of wicked men, so too Jesus would suffer at the hands of wicked men. And in his suffering, he would take the sins of his people on himself and suffer in their stead, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. We can only imagine the heights and the depths of where the conversation went as Moses and Elijah and the Lord Jesus spoke about the coming exodus. I imagine it was a little bit like what happened on the road to Emmaus as, uh, as the Lord went through the scriptures showing the disciples after he had risen from the dead how all of the scriptures pointed to him, the one who would come and die and be raised and, and, and go back to glory. And here with Moses and Elijah, they spoke about the coming exodus, the salvation of God's people. There was transfiguration. There was conversation, but finally, there was proclamation. And this proclamation came on the back of the disciples' reaction to what they had seen and heard. We read about their reaction in verse 5 and 6. Even though Peter had been brought face to face with the reality of who Jesus is and, and what he had come to do, even in incredible detail, confirming what Jesus had already said. Now he could hear it in the conversation of Moses and of Elijah. He was still taken up with himself. And isn't it incredible that we could be in the presence of God, hearing his words, singing his hymns, reading his words, and yet be far from him or be centered on ourselves? The first thing that came out of Peter's mouth was not my Lord and my God, but Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Undoubtedly, it was good for them to be there. But that shouldn't have been the first thing in Peter's mind. He was face to face with the King of Heaven, the one who rules over all of the angel armies, the one who created all things seen and unseen. His posture inwardly and outwardly should have been of humble praise. Now, I don't think that uh, we should start kneeling down in our services. But the posture of our hearts will be expressed in the posture of our bodies. And yes, these three men were flat on the ground. But what came out of Peter's mouth was, not my Lord and my God, but Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. There's a lesson here for us about worship. And it's to do with what we are looking for when we come to worship. 
Firstly and foremostly, we shouldn't be thinking about ourselves but him. Yes, we come to hear what he has to say to us, and therefore we must come hungry. Yes, we come to be blessed, knowing that it is good for us to be here. But before anything else, we come to worship the living God. Peter started in the wrong place, and from there he went downhill. He went on, verse 5, Let us make three tabernacles or three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I don't think that Peter was saying that Moses and Elijah should be worshipped, but he was putting them on an unhealthy par with the Lord Jesus. And if there is anybody that we put on a par with Jesus, whether they be from Scripture or from history or, or, or living presently, then we've got our priorities all wrong. Only Jesus is worthy of praise. We can't be of Paul or of Apollos or of this preacher or that preacher. Only Jesus is worthy to be followed. And when everybody else worthy of note is put in their rightful place, only Jesus remains supreme over all. Because he is the rock of his people. There is no other rock. In fact, that's exactly what we see happening here. Look at verse 8. Suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. What an in-person, important lesson this is for us to learn and, uh, and relearn and relearn and relearn that Jesus is enough. It's faith alone in Christ alone that saves us. And I wonder if we could say, as one new hymn says, Christ is enough for me. Peter was in danger of putting Moses and Elijah on a par with Jesus. But I think the thing that Peter was most guilty of was wanting to stay on the mountaintop. His reasoning went like this. If only they could stay on this mountaintop, then perhaps Jesus wouldn't need to go through with the cross. And, and, and perhaps Peter wouldn't have to fail as he followed him. Here was Peter trying to get in front again. When what should have, he should have been doing was following from behind. And Peter's problem is our problem. How often do we think we know better than the Lord? We think we know what's best for us. We think we know what's best for us when we worry about the future because we don't trust it to the Lord. We think we know what's best for us when we try and control our circumstances because we don't trust it to the Lord. Perhaps you're watching this and you're not saved. Why are you not saved? Is it because you still think that you know better than the Lord? That you can make it to heaven based on your own performance? That when you die and meet with God that you'll be okay? That he'll understand? That he'll have mercy? There can be no salvation without Christ's death. And there can be no receiving of that salvation without a humbling of ourselves to recognize our need of his death. Perhaps you're watching this and you are saved, but you would rather stay in the meeting on Sunday rather than step out and live for the Lord on a Monday. You're afraid of where following the Lord might take you. What does the Lord say to you? What does the Lord say to all of us? Verse 7, this is my beloved son, hear him. This proclamation from the Father came out of the cloud that overshadowed and engulfed the, free, the three frightened followers. 
God the Father had manifested his presence as he had done when he came down in the wilderness to Moses and in the temple to Solomon. And he did it because he had something of lasting and eternal importance to say, which is as relevant now as it was then. This is my beloved son. Hear him. There's only one way that we can live well in a way that's pleasing to God, that brings him glory, and that is by looking and listening to Jesus. How do we do that? By coming humbly and hungrily to his word and seeing him with the eyes of faith there. Reflecting on this glorious experience that we've only scratched the surface of, Peter would later write these words in 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him as he is. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. In other words, take heed to the Gospels. Take heed to the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament. Take heed to all that has been written in the Word of God, because it is here that we see Christ and are given the grace to live for Him. It's here that we see Him by faith until one day we will see Him with our eyes. And having been saved by Him, by His grace, we will be like Him because we will see him as he is. I wonder, is this your hope this morning? Do you know that on that great day you'll be accepted before him? How can you know? By coming to him as you are, by confessing your sins to him as they are, and by trusting him to save even you. It's a glorious picture here of who God is, and it's the glory of God that we see in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us.